Some of you may be wondering that uh, maybe I've gone daft and have forgotten that Palm Sunday is next Sunday. No, I haven't gone daft yet. Well, faith wonders some days. Um, actually, the whole staff wonders some days. But I have not forgotten. Uh, traditionally, our church has always had a big musical presentation on Palm Sunday, and we are going to do it again this year, next, next Sunday. So make sure you bring your friends for that Sunday, too. It'll be a glorious day. But also, uh, since we've always had the musical program, we've never really had an opportunity over the many years to read the, the, the story of, of the uh, entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and to have a, 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 a visit about that story. So I thought that we would go ahead and end, and end our Luke studies with this particular stu- story, and then we will have our great celebration on uh, Palm Sunday. So let us turn to our scripture for today found in the Gospel according to Luke, beginning with chapter 19, verses 28 through 41. Now Jesus has just finished a series of parables and teachings and stories with the disciples and the followers uh, that were with His disciples, and now He begins to turn to Jerusalem. After Jesus had said all these stories, He went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As He approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you untying it, tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them, and as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. And so they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. They were saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees, though, in the crowd said to Jesus, Teach, teacher, rebuke these disciples. I tell you, he replied, if you keep quiet, the, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. So is the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Gracious God, we again come here to imagine that day, to imagine what happened when you entered Jerusalem. And I pray that it can awaken us to the life that we should live for you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now the image that we have of the entry into Jerusalem is, a, is usually drawn from films or TV programs of a huge, huge crowd that everything in Jerusalem just stopped and everyone went to throw down their cloaks and the palm branches and Jesus coming in and a huge entry. But that's not really what probably happened. Now, we are drawing upon what we would have done. If we were going to have a parade for Jesus, what would we do in in San Antonio? Well, we would have floats there, all decorated, and probably have prizes for all the floats. We would have bands from various high schools and maybe one of the colleges. We would have cheerleaders, we'd have twirlers, we'd have clowns. We'd have people tossing candy out to the children. And yes, probably someone with a gun shooting the cascarones out into the sky. (laughs) But that's not God's pageant. That's our pageant. God's pageant was a little different. There were parts of the city that knew nothing of what was going on at the gate. There are parts of the city where people continued on in the marketplace selling their wares. 
There are parts of the city where people were getting ready for the holy days of Passover and buying their supplies and their foods. There are parts of the city of of people that sort of heard something was going on, but you know, I'm really busy right now. I don't have time to go and find out what's happening over on the city, at the city gate. The city did not stop as Jesus entered. It continued. And there were thousands of people there for the holy day. It was almost as if Jesus kind of came in quietly on the side. It wasn't the huge parade that we would think of. Now, God's pageant is filled with all types of people. There were the proud Pharisees there in their beautiful robes. There were the Sadducees with their laws to make sure everybody was living the way they should live and dressing the way they should dress. There were those who walked unsteady, who had once could not walk at all. There were those who now could see when they had never been able to see before. There were those in the crowd who were standing a little taller, feeling as if there was less of a burden on their life because this man had taken away the burden of their sin and the life that they had been living. There were those who heard of this man but had not seen him. You see, in their day, they didn't have the TV, they didn't have cameras, they didn't have newspapers and magazines where you could see the picture of Jesus around Galilee healing everybody. They didn't have that. They didn't have the reporters. It was just word of mouth. So there were some there who had heard the stories about this man Jesus, And so they wanted to come and see, who is this guy? Maybe some there in hopes that they could be healed by him. And then there were always those who were curious that happened to be in the area and they saw a big crowd and they're wondering what's going on. Oh, you know, the the ones like when you see an accident and everything slows down so you can see what's happening in the accident. Oh, they were there too, trying to see who is this guy and asking people people around, you know, what's happening and what's going on and why is that guy on a donkey? He entered the gate which led into the temple. Now, if any of you have ever been to Jerusalem, I had the fortunate to be able to go to Jerusalem at one time, you will notice real quickly, and I didn't have a concept of the magnitude of the city and and the closeness also of all the areas of the holy sites. But the gate that he went into is right across the valley from Garden of Gethsemane. The gate that he went into, he would have passed the garden, which in a few days he would be in the garden praying to God to remove this from him. But the garden, when you stand in the garden, you can look across the valley and you see the the whole city right in front of you. And it's a huge valley that you travel down to go back up to get into the major city. Now, some archaeologists believe that there may have been a gate, a, a bridge that went across the valley into the gate. The gate now is completely sealed. No entry in any, in any way. And the temple itself is under the Dome of the Rock built by the Muslims when they conquered Jerusalem. Completely different than what Jesus saw that day. God's pageant. People in the crowd were rejoicing. They began to think that maybe this is the Messiah and calling him the Messiah. They called him the king. The king uh, who who was coming in the name of the Lord. And that frightened the Pharisees and they were angry at Jesus for allowing them to continue to call him these these messianic names. They knew what they were saying, but Jesus rebuffed them. It was triumphal and yet sad. It was splendid and yet dreary. For the entry into Jerusalem meant also the end. Within a very short period of time, of just a few days, Jesus would be dead. And the people praising him on this day 
many of them would be the same people calling for his crucifixion on Friday. Now the Sanhedrin had issued a decree. If anyone finds this Jesus, let us know because we need to arrest him. We need to be able to quiz him and and imprison him. And yet the disciples, behind Jesus' own request, were bringing him right into Jerusalem in triumph. And Jesus now was publicly saying that he was the Messiah. Up to this point, as you have seen in Scripture, he had constantly told the people when they thought that he might be the Messiah, or he's the son of David, or whatever the titles they might give him, he would say, now just keep it quiet, don't tell anybody. Now the mask is off. Now he wants everyone to know who he is. And there was no turning back. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The people were expecting him to bring in the new kingdom. And they were overjoyed. They'd been waiting for centuries for this prophet to come, this Messiah to come, and to conquer those who were ruling them, to conquer the Romans. Like King David, who had brought them together as a kingdom and had killed, uh, had conquered all those around him, they wanted that again. And they've been longing for it for centuries. And now he's here. Now, next Sunday, we will be celebrating Palm Sunday, but it's also called Passion Sunday. Why do we call it Passion Sunday? Because of the dichotomy of the two. Palm Sunday represents the triumphal entry. He's the king. He's here. Passion Sunday is the beginning of the end. It's the reminder of what's coming at the end of the week. Now, from Monday through Wednesday, we don't really know much of what happened. I'm sure the city carried on doing all the things that they were doing before. Nothing really changed with Jesus entering into Jerusalem. And Jesus, no doubt, was with several followers, teaching them again, telling them the stories, and helping them understand what was maybe to come. But here's the thing. From Monday through Wednesday, the crowd, I think, was beginning to grow restless. When are you going to come out and be our true king? When are you going to bring your army in and wipe out the Romans? When are you going to do what we have been told the Messiah is supposed to do? And by Thursday, by Thursday, it was coming to the end. And so Jesus decided to gather his closest friends for a last supper. Now you think of it. If you knew that you just had a day or two left before you were to die, what would you do on that night? Wouldn't you want your closest friends, maybe your family, your relatives, neighbors, but you would want that to be a very special moment where you can share what, you, what they meant to you and you meant to them. That's what they were doing, I believe, that night. But also, one other thing was happening. One of them was beginning to prepare to betray him on Thursday night. And then, of course, on Friday, everything began to happen. He was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had the trial, and then he was crucified, all in the same day. Why? Because they wanted to get rid of him quickly. And the ending of the Passover was coming, so they needed to do it now. But my question to you is, where would you have been on Palm Sunday? Would you have been in the marketplace? Selling your wares? Not really a concerned about what was happening at the gate? Were, were you, would you be the one at the grocery store getting the supplies and everything for the big party that's coming up at your home? 
Or would you have been one of those who was in the crowd watching Jesus coming in? Maybe you were just the one that was curious about this Jesus. Maybe a little cynical. Yeah, they say he does all these things, but I want to see for myself. Or could you be one of those who was standing a little taller that day because Jesus had relieved you of the life that you were living? Or maybe you can see with eyes that you can never see with before. Where would you be? And then move it to Friday. Where would you be on Friday? Because the crucifixion was not, again, a huge all-Jerusalem affair. The city did not shut down. It's just another prisoner being sent off to be crucified. There'd be a group there, mostly family and friends and followers, that would be coming to see what was happening, and the Romans. But everybody else is doing their thing, living their life, not having a clue of what was to happen. Where would you be? And then on Easter Sunday, when he arose, where would you be? Or where would you be after the resurrection? Following with the disciples and spreading the good news of this Jesus who entered Jerusalem as the king and sharing with people about what it meant, his kingdom has come. Not like the kingdom they were expecting, but a kingdom that was from heaven. Where would you be? Amen.